Hello, welcome. Come on in, take a seat. Anyone who else wants to join and has your, your beer, hopefully? It's out in the courtyard if anyone's going to be really sad if they I missed it. Where, where it All right. Does anyone else need a place? Great. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome. I'm Brandy. Uh, I'm from Unity, a product manager here, and I'm joined by Micah from Google Cloud, my product counterpart over on the other side. And we're both really excited to be here today to talk about connected games. Uh, for many years, I've been passionate about making games that connect people in meaningful and exciting new ways. From Bungie to Phenomena, I've seen the breadth of challenges that game developers face when they're trying to connect people in their games. So for this talk, we'll talk first about how we think about connected games and what we perceive as the key problems that our developers are trying to solve when they're making these games. And then Micah will talk about Google Cloud and some of the power that we hope to bring to all of you as developers. And then I'll wrap up with a glimpse into our roadmap for connected games and what you can expect to see next. So what do we mean by connected games? For us, this is a new initiative at Unity where we're thinking very holistically about the spectrum of connected games, from dynamic single-player games like Pokemon Go all the way to persistent world MMO-style games like Crowfall. We believe that all games benefit from greater connectivity between their players and you, the developer. As some of you saw in the keynote, connected games really are the most successful games out there today. No matter how you slice it, they're the most played, the most watched, and the most revenue-generated games out on the market today. From what we can see, players are really enjoying seeing games that expand beyond a static game client. And why is this? From what we've seen, connectedness leads to greater engagement, of course, so more content, more gameplay, more people staying longer in your game, which gives you more chances to succeed and retain those players and be able to monetize from them. When we think about connected games, we found it helpful to break it down by cumulative levels. So the concept being that technologies in an L1 would also be valuable to an L2 or an L3 or an L4. So in the L1 case, we refer to those as dynamic single player games. They're games like Angry Birds, where the core gameplay loop is single player, and connectedness comes through features outside the core gameplay loop, like leaderboards or daily challenges. In the L2 case, we talk about those as turn-based or asynchronous multiplayer games, like uh, Hearthstone, where at that point, you actually have direct interactions between players, but in a latency-tolerant way. And in L3 is where we talk about real-time multiplayer games, like Titanfall 2, that are session-based. So you actually start a match, you end a match, and you come back out, and your servers don't have to persist. And then by L4, we're talking about persistent world games, like MMOs, where gamers expect to log in and always see the same world and the same server live at all times of the day. And in each of these levels, new technologies and new problems arise as you go further through the stack. So I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail. And I'll call on the use of cats to represent your players. In the L1 case, players like to peek in the door, but they rarely step through. So what we often see with single-player games is that gamers come in, they play a single game session, and they never come back. So all of our developers are trying to figure out how do they add connectedness in a way that gets their players through the door, coming back for more. A few ways that we see people approach this is <laughs> by incentives. <laughs> There's all kinds of different ways to add leveling and inventories. And the, the key challenge here is that novelty is key. So if those incentives run out, if your gamers stop finding things that they're excited about, it no longer is effective. So by adding new content, by being able to update dynamically, you can keep these incentives available to your gamers at all the time and continue to grow the game even beyond the initial release. 
Similarly, people start adding competition, even in single-player games. You'll, you'll most often see this as leaderboards, but it can also be seen in, in more engaging kinds of ways. Like in Pokemon Go, there's the concept of gyms, where a player can put themselves out there to be challenged. You can see their Pokemon's health score, and you can say, you know what, I bet I can challenge that with my character. And so even though that player has no idea that you're out in the world challenging them at that very moment, you're competing against their health score and may take over their location of the world. So it's still single player, but even then, you're adding really more engaging competition to the game. And on the flip side is cooperation. In, in this example, you can see the Pokemon Go concept of raids, where there's a shared boss for some amount of time in a single place. And again, people don't even necessarily know that they're interacting with each other, but they're sharing in a goal to bring all of their characters together to take down a single boss. These are all really powerful mechanics to try to add retention, even in single-player games. When we talk about L2, we start to see direct player interactions, even though it's a latency-tolerant way of interacting. In this case, you have to be able to pass your game state back and forth, and you also have to start thinking about cheating and detecting or preventing it. So people, <laughs> they can be a little bit messy. At, at this stage, people start to ask themselves, do I want to focus on friends in my games and assume that these are people that know each other and they're people they trust, or do they focus on strangers? From what we've seen, there's not usually enough friends to, to make most games successful that just depend on those. So in those cases, you have to accept that strangers may be an option that you need to think about. So how do players match in together? And how do you give them just enough ability to communicate but still feel safe? Like in the example of Hearthstone, they use an emote system instead of a full chat system so that people can communicate, but in ways that we know is going to be a safe and fairly enjoyable experience. And then there's the asynchronous multiplayer technology. So how do you get your bits passed back and forth, and how does it happen in close enough to real time to stay engaging? If you had to wait for an entire match of Hearthstone to play out before you could actually see anything that happened, it would, be, it would get pretty boring pretty fast. So how can you get that information passed relatively quickly, uh, but not necessarily with the full expensive tech of a real-time multiplayer game? Similarly, you have to ask the question of what happens if your game does start getting pretty competitive. How do you detect or prevent the cheaters in your game who will hack a game client and start sending false information back and forth to each other. There are a couple of approaches to this. One is detection, so you're sending data back and forth and presumably storing that in a database somewhere. So some developers will start checking that data to say, did this number look wrong? Like, did, can I set some rules that say this was out of the range of what was reasonable? Or there's the concept of prevention, where maybe you have some little bits of logic running in the cloud, where maybe it's a roll of a dice, that anytime someone rolls a dice, it calls a function that's running in the cloud that just says, yes, I am the one making sure this is an even distribution of ones through sixes, and then it returns a number back. In which case, then you actually get cloud authority, and you can prevent the cheating, as opposed to having to detect it and then ban people. And then we get to L3 are real-time multiplayer games. And in these cases, we start to add the core real-time multiplayer tech and challenges with the community and toxicity. In real-time multiplayer games, every millisecond counts. Whenever you're passing your bits from one client all the way potentially across the country to another client, you have to think about how fast that's going to get there and the fact that it just won't actually be instantaneous. So do you have to predict where someone will be at a given time, given their trajectory? What are all the things you need to think about to make it truly feel real time, even though it actually can't be, even in the best of cases? There are a couple of common topologies for how people choose to build their real-time multiplayer games. In the past, Unity has relied really heavily on peer-to-peer -peer technologies because it's a relatively cheap way to build a multiplayer game. You don't have to have anything hosted in the cloud. The clients connect just directly to each other. What we've seen, though, is that many games that rely on this technology can't succeed. So what we've been investigating really heavily and starting to move into, as some of you saw in the keynote, is dedicated server technology. 
In these cases, you can ensure a very consistent connection quality between all of your players because you control the hardware that is, that is ensuring that connection. You can scale to whatever number of players your game really wants to be or needs to be, where the peer-to-peer -peer connections really start to drop off after a dozen or so players in most cases. You can have, like I said before, the server authoritative code so you can prevent cheating. And you can iterate faster, because all the code that's running in the cloud doesn't require a client update. So passing cert again every time you need to update or send a new set of code to your clients, in a lot of cases, you could just send to the server without going through that process. And then, of course, there's communities. I think many of us are here because we've had really meaningful interactions with our other fellow cats in the world. And, uh, and it's powerful. I have, I have gotten to know some really incredible people through games, and the potential is amazing. The hard part is that you know, passionate gamers are often not tactful, and it's, it's a challenge to figure out the right ways to facilitate those kinds of positive interactions while you know, avoiding and not really having to deal as much with the, the challenges of scaling toxicity problems. We kind of talked about the chat and emote concept of offering different levels of interaction depending on how well you know a person. But then there's also the concept of communities within a game. So how do you build tools such that people can form their own communities and manage them as they believe they want to run? Because you know what, what's a good community for one person may be different for somebody else and how they like to interact. So figuring out ways that we can give tools back to players so that they can manage their groups of people themselves is kind of a more scalable way to let people build out the sorts of communities that they care about. There's also the concept of forums or other offline communication. We've seen over and over again that global forums are really hard to manage, especially at scale. If you get to millions of players, suddenly it's almost impossible to hire enough community managers to keep that community healthy. But in cases where it is more contextual, say to a guild or to a friend group or to other specific purposes, they can actually be really productive ways to plan events or coming together at specific times. So having some form of tools to allow people even out of your game to be able to talk to each other can be a really valuable tool. And then finally, in the worst of cases, player management. How do you allow someone to report something really egregious and how do you give them the tools to be able to get out? And then last but not least is the, the, uh, the beautiful ideal of persistent worlds and MMOs. It has all of the challenges of L1 through L3 that we just discussed, as well as now the persistent world tech. How do we keep these servers online available to people all the time? It is a really hard problem. Poor Bubs, he's, he's a little lost. So in, in these cases, you have to start thinking about how you split up massive numbers of people across lots of different servers in a way that it still feels like they're in the same world all the time. Or, you know, which, which could include sharding, or it could include, you know, like some MMOs just get you straight into a particular server. Even in those cases, your servers may need to stay live for a week or 12, you know, 14 days or more before you can recycle them. And keep getting, getting your server runtime so clean that it doesn't have memory leaks, it never crashes, it never has anything go wrong, is surprisingly hard. And uh, it's something we at Unity are, <laughs> are thinking about really hard, because we want to be able to provide a server runtime that could stay live for two weeks and still be fine. We're not there yet, but it's a, it's a hard problem that's worth solving. And then you have to have databases that can link in real time, passing massive amounts of data to massive amounts of players, potentially across the globe, so that you know, OK, every single one of these players has this information. They've logged in. They're authenticated. How do we solve these really massive problems? This is just the summary that we ran through. I would love feedback about how others have been thinking about these problems and what they've seen as successful approaches to solving them. Because we're just at the beginning of a whole lot of initiatives that are starting to kick off. So from here, and I'll talk more in specific about the roadmap in just a little bit, we, as Unity, always care about accessibility. Getting things to reasonable cost and, and great usability is something that we think is important for democratization of the space. And I heard from someone not long ago that I thought was a really great point, is that you have to build for success first. So if your game scales to millions of people, we want our developers to be able to succeed on any technology that we provide to you. 
So our, our services need to be scalable and flexible and performant and reliable. And that's really why I'm excited to hand off to Micah from Google. They've been working on cloud services at massive scale for a long time, and they have some powerful stuff that we're really excited to start building with them. Thank you, Brandy. <clears throat> I can't say how excited I am to actually talk about this stuff because we've been working together for months on this. Uh, and this is our first opportunity to give you a sneak peek into what our, our plans are uh, in combining our powers. Uh, I have to give you just a quick background uh, for myself, of course, before I go into my spiel. Uh, I care a lot about gaming. I've been playing games ever since I was old enough to walk. And uh, it's one of my favorite activities. And I'm very attracted to uh, games that are clearly big ideas built with passion. I will always invest in those games. Um, I, I believe strongly in uh, supporting that community. And so I'm super excited that I can be part of um, empowering the developer community to be able to make more of those games because then I get to play them. Uh, so <laughs> selfishly, this is, that's the only reason why I have this job is because I want more <laughs> high quality games. Uh, so I have to do a, a quick little background on you know, why Google Cloud. Uh, you may or may not uh, understand the uh, significance of Google Cloud partnering with Unity, and so we're going to kind of uh, walk through a little bit of the, uh, the synergies there. We really believe strongly in open source and openness in general. And Google is uh, actually a leader in the open source community with over 2,000 projects just on our own opensource.google.com website, uh, and some of our projects on GitHub uh, such as TensorFlow are some of the most popular uh, open source projects out there. Uh, we also believe strongly in performance and great engineering. So as you may have heard in the uh, keynote yesterday, uh, if a game server for a multiplayer game is running on uh, Google Cloud, the game servers can scale up in one-fifth of the time of a competing cloud provider. So we really think that's a significant benefit to uh, solving these hard problems in the L1 through L3 or L4 space, particularly uh, in that session-based multiplayer uh, game category. So we think that we also have some additional uh, innovations that will help you. I'm going to talk about a couple of things uh, that are kind of Google Cloud-specific um, tools that will, will benefit you directly. Uh, when you look at the L1 through L4 space that uh, Brandy was talking about earlier, it's pretty clear the scientific graph with no scale, uh, shows <laughs> definitively that as infrastructure increases, connectedness is increasing too, right? I probably said that backwards. Uh, <laughs> but L4 is like this ultimate uh, point of connectivity. It's always on, it's always connected, and it's going to have the greatest demand on infrastructure. It, it has to work reliably all the time, and it has to be performant. So what will this look like for you? What we're aiming to do together is provide you this back-end infrastructure through your Unity environment. So you won't be uh, worrying about things like, how do I turn on my services in Google Cloud? Uh, you don't even have to worry about, do I have an account in Google Cloud? You don't have to have one. Uh, you'll be able to set up these, uh, these services from within the Unity environment. So you don't have to focus on infrastructure, and uh, you don't have to get a cloud certification. What we're trying to do is simplify access to the cloud infrastructure and some of the services involved uh, through that same environment. And then we'll do the other work of making the infrastructure scale for you. So you'll be able to do all the same things uh, that you've been doing with Unity from you know, building your games with all the new technologies that were just talked about yesterday. Um, and also integrate some additional things that we'll be able to add. Launching will be easier and more reliable because we'll be able to uh, scale up on those servers I talked about. We'll also be able to uh, leverage all of the other uh, analytics and uh, the new open source matchmaking project that we talked about uh, to engage your players and make them dynamic living games. So I want to just briefly talk about what I think is an exciting uh, example of a connected game uh, that just recently was released, uh, Dragon Ball Legends. Uh, this is using a unique architecture. So we're going to watch just a quick video from the developers of the game uh, that you can find on YouTube. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what this means uh, in the context of connected games. So we'll find out how the audio sounds in just a moment.
I think I may have to click play. Dragon Ball Legends. It's an all-new title, a uh, 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 mobile app that will be released in 2018. And as you can see on the screen, the gameplay will be in 3D, heavily action-oriented, and also we're pretty excited to talk about it today. We made sure that the details and everything are all fine-tuned so that it's exactly what the Dragon Ball fans wanted on a mobile app. So one of the biggest features that we have for this game, actually, is the global real-time player versus player on cloud network. So let me uh, say that one more time. It's global, it's real-time, and it is actually player versus player. It, we're not going to muck around with, uh, by providing pseudo experiences of player versus player where players fight other player data. It's not going to be like that. We'll actually have the players be fighting one-on-one, -on -one, anywhere, anytime. So uh, you know what, to give you a really good idea as to what it'll be like. We're actually gonna have, and uh, point A being here in Moscone Center, where Keigo will be playing against another team member of ours that is currently in Japan, our uh, Tokyo headquarters, actually. So um, I just copy and pasted the Google map, actually. But you, as you can see, there's 5,100 miles apart. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Ayaka, that's one of our team members. And uh, so she's currently in Tokyo right now. The right screen is her uh, mobile app screen. Left screen is Kago's, and I would appreciate it if the audio was played in the background a little bit louder. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the game itself is one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, each player can bring up to three playable characters. The objective of the game is to defeat the opponent's three characters before the opponent. All right, and they're both ready. So. Uh, thanks to Google's uh, cloud networking, we managed to create a really stable uh, playing field where users don't really need to worry about internet connection, latency, and whatnot. All they need to worry about is the opponent that's going to be in front of them on the screen. All right, it seems like the game connected, and it's still black. Oh, there we go. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> so. The game started right now. Left screen is Kago. Uh, he will probably uh, show off some of the cool cutscenes that each character has, but it's heavily action oriented, but in actuality, the controls are quite simple. We made sure that it's intuitive, and we made sure that uh, everybody who's, who wants an action game on Dragon Ball can play other players without having to worry about getting their butt hand handed to them. So, uh, as you can see, the Ayaka just activated her uh, special skill. The four cards that can be seen on the bottom of the screen, those are uh, universal cards that each player has. And whenever you tap them, the character will automatically do an action oriented to that specific card. And each character will have something different. For example, you tap the red card, you can do a melee attack. You tap the yellow card, you can do a long ranged. And the blue one is a special attack. And also, by tapping them consecutively, the uh, character will automatically uh, create combos. So. Oh, just like right now, actually. It's a special cutscene right now, and uh, it looks really complex when you first see it, honestly. But, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, see, she had no choice. He's her boss. <laughs> All right, uh, back to the presentation, please. All right, thank you. So, as you can see, the game, it's... All right, sorry. As you can see, the game itself uh, runs actually fairly smoothly, even though the uh, connection was done uh, over the ocean. Um, players who are outside the country that you're living in can obviously definitely fight against you with no worries about uh, latency, any problems, and network lag or whatsoever, thanks to the Google Cloud Platform. Honestly, we, we could not have realized this entire project without this service. And also, as for the second point as to why we use GCP, this entire title, this is going to be a flagship title of sorts for us. It's going to be on a whole new level of just entire bigness. So we know that there's going to be an immense amount of traffic coming in. And the bigger the traffic is, we need to make sure that the infrastructure can handle it. More database, uh, more sharding and whatnot. And the bigger the system gets, the more complex it gets and inevitably leading to higher uh, just human error and a higher uh, chance of human error happening and higher cost for taking care of it. And when we have a title like this where we have hundreds of thousands of users constantly playing against each other, we want to make sure that they always have the right experience that we prepare.
prepared for them. So in order to do that, we uh, used, utilized the cloud spanner to create a more uh, simpler architecture so that we don't really need to worry too much about human error happening or uh, other costs that might happen. So another thing that we use the GCP for is uh, stack driver logging and big query. Like you might have heard a couple minutes ago, we want to record literally everything. We want to make sure that we can uh, see what the users is doing and the key performance indicators are used properly so that we can create a constant content update where users have something new to do, users have something to come back to maybe every other day, every, every day, hopefully every day. But uh, we want to create a content that's constantly evolved. So let's walk through it and unpack that a little bit. Uh, why is that an innovative architecture? So there's a few points. First of all, uh, notice that they were talking about how as you design the game, you have to think about what does success look like. When you get really big, are you necessarily thinking ahead about how much more complex your operations are going to be, how much more expensive your operations are going to be, and how much more likely you are to experience human error uh, taking your game offline? So uh, they rethought their database concepts. Instead of doing the traditional workflow where maybe they're starting with a database uh, that's just MySQL or something on their workstation, and they're like, hey, this was working. We just keep trying to scale that up and scale it up. And eventually, you get to a global scale, and you have a, quite a complex database to manage. It's easier to break, and it's uh, more prone to the uh, human error and higher cost. So this product uh, spanner is a, a unique uh, product because it's a global database. So what they were doing is uh, actually uh, operating as an L2 game that we were talking about before, so turn-based multiplayer, but the turns were happening so fast that the players experience it as an L3 real-time multiplayer game. So they were writing things down in San Francisco and in Tokyo, and the moment that they got the OK, your write completed, they know that that's the moment they can read that same data halfway around the world and trust that it will be read. So it is a true globally accessible database. That's a really big deal. It changes the way you might approach how you design your game from the beginning. Instead of just doing what, what we've done traditionally, uh, they were able to rethink a global game. So I think it's really exciting. Uh, what we're going to do is make that really incredible database accessible to anyone in the Unity environment. So whether you are already a aaa size studio, or you're just getting started with aspirations to become one, you'll have access to the same tools, and we'll reduce the complexity for using that tool. You'll be able to say, I need a global database, uh, and be able to start using that in your development environment. I wanted to uh, play one more video to look at the other side of Google Cloud. Uh, was, I was just giving you some uh, information on the technology side, and I should have also mentioned that the network was important. At the keynote, Diane had mentioned that there's a lot of private fiber optic network. That means that the traffic can be controlled internally that entire way. You don't hop off of this network and then go on to someone else's network you can't control. It's nice to know that you're on one controlled private network globally. That makes a big difference for latency. So this is uh, from another well-known uh, developer. And I want you to pay attention to their focus on the people aspect. And unfortunately, oh, no. the uh, subtitles are not showing up. Wow. Can you translate in real time? I could invite Joseph up to translate for me, uh, <laughs> but I won't do that. Uh, you, you can share over. The, the paraphrasing of the video is that they had a big project to work on, and it was a hard, uh, a hard problem to solve. And they went through and worked with Google engineers to understand what's the correct way to architect for this new type of game they wanted to build. And this was a, a big deal for this developer uh, to launch this. And so the Google engineers uh, were trying to understand the scale of this. 
And when they were looking at the numbers uh, of what this could look like, it was like, wow, this is a really, this is big reach. This could hit big numbers. Uh, launch day could be really big. And so there's a lot of considerations that go into launch planning. There was a ton of coordination between the teams uh, to plan the architecture and do testing, load testing, uh, and come up with something that actually solved their problem and hit the scale that they needed. And also not just scale, but how fast can you hit that scale uh, if it becomes really popular. So in the end, uh, the message was that they couldn't have done this without the people. There were people who cared deeply about solving their problem. Uh, and that's one of my favorite things about the culture at Google. Um, that's something that we think we can bring a value to the Unity community uh, is a, a deep passion for helping you solve your engineering problems. We have some of the best engineers in the world working on the cloud. Uh, it's amazing what happens when you let them attack a gaming problem. Everyone at Google loves games too. That's part of our culture internally. Uh, so it's, it's quite fun to help solve these problems and architect something with you. Uh, so one last thing I wanted to uh, uh, mention is uh, machine learning, which is another strength uh, of Google's. Uh, we think that machine learning has a lot of potential to help with some of those hard problems that Brandy talked about uh, for the L1 through L4 space. So, like, think about things like player toxicity. That's a really hard problem um, when you're getting into scale and persistent worlds. Uh, how do you deal with, um, with that communication? So we think that some problems might be almost impossible to solve without machine learning. And I'm going to give you some examples of what we think are, are some pretty good potential uh, problems to solve with machine learning. Some of them we've already built prototypes for. Uh, but before I get into that, why should you care about our approach to machine learning? Well, in fact, uh, we've been using machine learning with games from the beginning. All of our work in developing our AI and, and ML uh, it has been uh, based on games. So this is an example of a model that uh, trained itself. And you can see the right side uh, after uh, it had been trained how much more effective it was at playing the game. It's a really great environment to use machine learning because there are bounds. There are certain types of games that have uh, the right characteristics for machine learning. There are some games that are very hard for machine learning, like open world spaces, where you don't have bounds that are easy for the machine learning to uh, understand. Um, you might have heard of the AlphaGo um, gaming project uh, that was actually done using cloud resources to train itself. It played against itself over 30 million times to get as good as it was uh, to beat humans, which is kind of a big deal for that game. Uh, internally, we're using machine learning in about every product uh, possible where we think that it makes sense, which is in a lot of places, and that continues to grow. Uh, but how would we apply ML to gaming? So here's just some ideas we have. Uh, on where we could use ML to solve some hard problems. Whether it's from taking out the tedious work of QA and letting humans focus on QA that's really human appropriate, uh, and using ML to run through levels, find where you're clipping, uh, find out where uh, someone could get trapped, for example. Uh, you could use ML. Uh, we already, already have some examples of in-game chat translation in real time. Uh, that could be used, if you extend that, it could be used for tracking player toxicity. A human couldn't actually moderate every possible chat happening across millions of players, but machine learning could. It could be trained to uh, identify toxic players and prevent their chats from uh, getting through to someone else. So you could actually enrich your player community and increase engagement. Uh, it could be used in matchmaking, making sure that you have an ideal match with uh, various uh, data sets that you want to feed in that's unique to your game. Uh, and of course, a really important one would be fraud and cheat detection. We think that there's uh, some other examples beyond this. This is just kind of a starting point. But these are the uh, types of problems that we think we can solve with machine learning. So I, it's fun to talk about machine learning. You hear it in the news all the time. And everyone's like, machine learning is going to change the world. It's amazing. And then uh, usually uh, you're like, OK, how is it going to change the world? Or like, how are we going to do that? And turns out it's kind of hard. Um, we just know that it's got great potential. But when you sit down to try to use it, um, it could lead to uh, pretty quick frustration. So uh, I wanted to just mention briefly that there's a website that you can go to. This is part of our efforts to democratize ML, ai.google slash education, uh, where you can get a wealth of resources uh, to help you get started and build that foundation. Uh, they're all free resources. So 
this website will walk you through uh, tailoring the content to your needs. Uh, you might be able to tell it, uh, I'm actually a student or I'm a, I'm a business person. And it will hide the things that, if, if, you're, if you're saying you're a non-technical role, it will hide the things that are super technical and let you focus on uh, what's appropriate for you. And you can say what level of uh, learning you're at, too. Uh, there's lots of videos, courses, hands-on things, and you could even uh, jump into sample code when you feel ready. So it's a great place if you want to get involved with uh, machine learning and you're not quite sure where to start. This is a really good uh, resource that we'll continue to add content to, and we hope to add Unity-specific content uh, so that we can give you tutorials on how to use machine learning in gaming. So uh, in summary, we think that together, Google Cloud and Unity uh, can accelerate game development life cycles. We're going to remove complexity. This is a shared philosophy that we have. Uh, take the hard things, make them easier, and let you just focus on the core thing that you're here to do, and that's to build great games. Um, we think that uh, we can help with all of those problem spaces of L1 through L4 uh, with that combined effort. And so in, to talk about more of the future things from Unity, I'm going to hand it back to Brandy so she can walk you through the roadmap. All right, I'll try to be as brief as I can so we have a few minutes for questions at the end. So uh, what's on the horizon is that we are focusing first on real-time multiplayer games. Based on all the feedback we've gotten from many, many developers, it sounds like this is the, the, the real-time space in general is the space that has the most need still currently. That game developers really want to make these kinds of games and it's still just hard. It's hard to build in it, and then it's hard to succeed in it, too. So in the keynote, we talked about this dedicated game server technology, the fact that this is now a real-time multiplayer topology that we believe is important for our game developers to have access to. So there's the hosting and scaling components. In the keynote, we demonstrated between multiplayer and GCP the ability to scale to 1.5 million players over just a few minutes of time. They have really powerful technology and flexible infrastructure and 24-7 support. And it's currently a primarily enterprise product that we're working on bringing to all of our developers. And we're in active development to make that possible. <laughs> Once you have your server, you have to figure out what you want to run on it. And right now, we know some game developers are trying to use our headless runtime, meaning headless meaning that it doesn't run any of the graphics but we also want it to be able to strip out anything else that you don't want it to be able to do so that it can be as slim and fast as possible and so that you're not paying for hardware usage that you didn't actually need. So we're working on reducing CPU usage and memory and also working on getting the uptime to last a lot longer so you're not recycling your servers all the time. Our cat's going on a diet. Uh, and then how you get your game and your game server out to uh, multi-plays environment. We're working on integrating with Cloud Build and through editor command line tools so that however you want to get your server to multi-play, you should be able to do it directly in the Unity environment. And then finally, once, you're, once your server is out and live and, and hosted in multi-play, you'll need to know what's happening on it. If something crashed or if something is laggy and you don't understand where the performance problems are coming from, in the developer dashboard, you'll be able to see your logs, see your stats, see your profiles so you can start to figure out what's going wrong if something is going wrong, or when you have optimized something, see the results of your hard work. The next piece is the lowest level of networking. We're rethinking all of our networking stack and starting from the bottom up, which means that we're beginning with a very minimal transport layer such that it's as fast as possible without anything else included. And, and because of that, it's ECS compatible by default. From here, we'll be adding additional optional layers like reliability. Like if you don't care if every single packet of data makes it through, that shouldn't be a required piece of your networking layer. That should be something that you add optionally as your game needs it. And then we also know that every game for ev all the rest of the networking pieces like forward prediction and lag compensation, all of, and maybe even compression, all of those things are very specific to the kind of game you want to make. So we're working on archetypes or sample games that give our developers all the open source to a real project that is developed as a real developer would actually build and launch a game. 
to use that as a starting point for how you might go about building that in your own game too. So that now it's very specific to, to every kind of use case that we know is, is out today. Uh, and both the archetype and the transport layer will be open source this time, so you'll have greater debugability than anything we've offered in the past. And matchmaking. As we announced in the keynote, we're working on an open source project with GCP. And you should all go and see right after this in this room, uh, Caleb and Joseph are going to dive really deeply into that architecture. So I won't say much about it. Uh, other than that, we're all really focused on flexible and extensible designs so that it, you can tailor it exactly to your game needs. And then the Unity hosted version should be something that could work directly off the shelf. Uh, and this, this beautiful diagram is Joseph's, so you should come and see more of it later if you're interested. And then beyond this, we're thinking about a lot of other kinds of services and tools that hopefully would add value back to our developers as they're trying to make their connected games. And I won't go into a lot of detail on these because it's still, to some extent, up to what we hear from you and what you all need. So please send us feedback. Please reach out. And we have about five minutes for questions. So uh, oh, oh, I, I just wanted to do a victory cat because I think <laughs> between, between Unity and all of our years of, and, and labor of love for game developers paired with Google's incredible expertise and power of their infrastructure, I think our game developers can only win, and we're really excited about what's ahead. OK, now questions. <laughs> And uh, there's mics up here at the front, so please go ahead and head to those if you have questions. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. I'm totally hyped about this new corporation. Yay. Um, and say hypothetically, I had a game that already runs in the Google Cloud with dedicated Unity servers making Great. use of unit code. Uh, how smooth? I mean, it's really early in the corporation, I know, but how smooth will the transition be from going there to there? Right. Like this new transport layer, you mean, is it from ground up so new that I have to recode, or is it basically just if, magically there? If you're using the low-level API, I know that, uh, for example, the FPS sample that we showed at the keynote uh, had been built using the low-level API. And then over a few weeks leading up to the event, we did swap it to the new transport layer. So. It didn't seem bad, but I wasn't the one doing it, so I won't try to speak to it too heartily. But I would say the low-level API is, is a reasonable transition. High-level API will be harder. Because you'll get rid of the post-processing stuff that's happening, with, or will it be replaced with a new high-level API? The, the goal for the high-level API is that it gets replaced by all these archetypes. That we, we believe the high-level API was almost too generalized because it was trying to do too much for too many things and kind of wasn't necessarily ideal for any, any of the particular use cases. So the archetypes will be more specialized and give you open source to then tailor that to exactly what you need it to do. OK, great. Looking and I could forward. answer your Google question, too. Uh, so, and this is good for anybody who already is using Google Cloud. Uh, we're going to set this up so that you can bring your account that you're already using and connect and link it to your Unity account uh, and take advantage of all the integrations that we're working on. Or if you don't have a, a Google Cloud account, you can just be in Unity and start uh, using those resources directly. You're welcome to still have a Google account or not have an account. We'll, we'll work both ways. OK, great. All right, we're about out of time. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Have a great rest of your...